Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to this uh, very special event. My name is Tony Irwin, and I'm the Chairman of Engineers Australia Nuclear Engineering Panel. Um, this is a special joint event with the Australian Nuclear Association. I'd uh, particularly like to thank the ANA for arranging this excellent venue that we've got. I'd also like to thank Dennis Cook and the Australian Institute of Energy for helping to, to publicise this event as well. So I'll now hand over to Robert Parker, ANA Vice President, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Tony, and it's wonderful to see such a response here today. Jacopo Buongiorno is a TEPCO professor of nuclear science at Massachusetts Institution of Technology. He's Director of Science and Technology of the Nuclear Research Laboratory at MIT. Of particular relevance to Australia is the work that Jacopo and his colleagues have been doing on system energy costs and the way in which nuclear can address those. And that's really part of the debate we need to be looking at in Australia. And he's also, his group is also looking at the economic constructions, changes in the way nuclear power plants are constructed. I met Jacopo at ICAP, the International Conference on Advanced Public Power Plants in uh, France in May of this year. Um, it, was a, it was a great conference and Jacopo is a very disciplined chair of those conferences. He's got a number of other skills, however. He's a, he's a real all-rounder, this chap. <clears throat> he rides a bike brilliantly. He's a great cook. But his key skill in life is that he's a terrific didgeridoo player. <laughs> so I'll hand over to Jacopo. Thank you. Now, Rob, you have raised the expectations to an impossibly high level. Now they're probably expecting that I would extract the didgeridoo and start playing. <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> um, I, I think this uh, excellent turnout has obviously a sign that there is an interest in nuclear energy. Let me broaden to uh, the, the, the topic also of climate change and technology in general. And of course, at MIT, we're all about science and technology, so that pleases me uh, very, very much. So I decided to title the um, today's talk, uh, Nuclear Energy, A New Beginning. I guess the question mark is required. Uh, nuclear has certainly a bit of a tortured uh, history, not just in Australia, but everywhere in the world. Uh, and, uh, you will see based on analysis that we have completed at MIT over the past three years, we think that um, this is a technology that can play a very important role, particularly in addressing climate, climate change, as I will explain. Because I am in Australia, and as you gather from my interest in the jury do and other things, I really love this country. I also made a point of adding towards the back end of my talk a few slides of why this could be um, a tremendous opportunity for Australia to reconsider uh, nuclear energy and what role it might play in this in this country. So in my uh, presentations, which I have targeted to be about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end, I will be leveraging heavily the uh, results of a study which we completed in 2018. You see the cover page here. This can be freely downloaded um, at the MIT website if you're interested. And essentially this uh, study says four things. The first is that when deployed efficiently, which essentially means at a reasonable cost, um, nuclear can actually prevent electricity cost escalations in a decarbonized grid. I'll try to dissect this statement uh, later on for you. But essentially what it means is that if you're trying to decarbonize efficiently your power sector and other sectors of your economy, any nuclear in the mix, not just nuclear, but nuclear being an important component of that mix, along with solar and wind, and frankly also fossil fuels with carbon capture and sequestration, is the most efficient way to achieve your target, which is deca de de decarbonization. Um, however, you might be aware that the cost of uh, new nuclear uh, power plants, particularly in the West, and by that I mean Western Europe and the US, has been escalating. That's bad news. That trend has to be uh, reversed. Um, uh, in incidentally, I will point this out 
uh, more clearly later on, but that's not been the case in other parts of the world, uh, China, South Korea, uh, India, and, and Russia to an extent have been able to uh, deploy nuclear, new nuclear power plants at a very reasonably low cost and, and, and on time. But in the West, the experience has not been that good. In our study, we spent a um, great deal of time trying to understand where the cost of uh, new nuclear energy really is. Is it the plant, is the fuel, is operation and maintenance? And when you're building a plant, exactly where it is. Is it the direct cost of the equipment? Is the cost of engineering? Is the cost of installation? So I'll try again to tease out the, the issues there. Um, we found, good news, that there are ways to reduce the cost of new nuclear and therefore making it uh, you know, making it an attractive option in a market uh, in a market context. And then finally, while these are powerful messages for the industry, the industry really has to sort of pull its act together, particularly in the West, and start delivering these uh, products at uh, at uh, at the reasonable cost. There is also an important message for government. Uh, government has to de develop uh, policies and approve policies that essentially put all clean energy technologies on the same uh, on the same level. And, and that's really the most efficient and effective way to achieve decarbonization. So uh, that's, uh, those are sort of the key messages that uh, you should take away from this presentation. I'm gonna walk you through uh, the details. So let's start with the big picture. You might have seen uh, similar plots before. This is the so-called Human Development Index, which is an aggregate measure of standards of living, access to health and, uh, and education um, uh, services and it's plotted here as a function of the electricity use per capita, access uh, to uh, electricity. And each dot on this, on this plot is a different country and the size of the dot is proportional to the population of that country. Anything below 0.8 Human Development Index is considered unacceptable or anyway in need of further development. And so you can see just synoptically, just at a glance, that roughly half possibly more of the world is yet to climb this curve. The bottom line here, or the message here, is that there is an enormous need for uh, additional electricity generation if we are to see uh, standards of living uh, increase worldwide. In fact, the quantitative prediction, uh, which is generated by the International Energy Agency and, and other groups, uh, uh, I think biannually, is that by 2040, the, elect the electricity consumption worldwide will grow by about 45%. So that's, that's, a very, that's a very large number. Uh, this is just electricity, but you can think of other sectors of the economy like transportation, uh, industry, buildings, agriculture to sort of be proportional to them. So you can expect roughly a 50% uh, you know, increase in, in uh, all primary energy source uh, availability in the, next, uh, in, in the next 20 years. And that's, that's a big number. So uh, the plot here shows the primary energy consumption. This is now everything. It's electricity plus the other sectors that I mentioned as a function of time. And it breaks it down by primary energy sources. So the, the three at the bottom, red, gray, and black, are oil, coal, and natural gas, respectively. And you can see that over the decades, the share of primary energy consumption that comes from fossil fuels has actually increased. So for all the good sort of intentions about decarbonization and mitigating climate change. Um, actually, we're not winning. The CO2 emissions are, are increasing. Um, I like this plot for a number of reasons. It's very simple. It also shows that uh, the magnitude of the challenge that we're facing, if we're serious about decarbonizing the, the, the global economy, is enormous. Because essentially, the tiny little slivers that you can barely see at the top that represent nuclear, hydroelectric, and then other renewable energies, to be clear, solar and wind, are very, very small. And what we need to go to a system where those tiny little slivers become the whole. Okay, so again, the magnitude is really, is really, uh, the challenge is really big. So a question on everybody's mind, I understand also here in Australia is, can we decarbonize using only wind and solar? It's a perfectly legitimate question. Uh, in general, I think if you have a complicated uh, problem, you want to probably maximize the number of options that you keep open. And a balanced approach to, the, uh, you know, to, to addressing the problem is usually the best one. But let's look at the fact at MIT, and here we are at university, we want to look at numbers. This is, I hope everybody can read this one. I'm going to use the EU, the European Union, as an example. It's an interesting example, it's an interesting sort of test bed to see which energy policies work and which do not because it's a relatively small continent, it's 20 plus countries, they 
all have their different energy policies, they all like different technologies, and they're all more or less interconnected in a big continental grid. So it really allows you to sort of look uh, head on what works and what doesn't, and what works less. So the first plot there uh, shows the share of essentially solar and uh, wind renewables generation over a period of one year. And um, over that period, the average in the European Union was about 20% for solar and wind. And there are six countries that are above that, uh, that average. They are Denmark, Ireland, Germany, Portugal, Spain, and Finland. By definition, those are the countries that have invested the most in solar and wind, and they're getting you know, a significant fraction of their electricity from, from those energy sources. The next plot I'm gonna show you is the so-called carbon intensity of the uh, power sector. Carbon intensity is the amount of CO2 that is emitted per unit electricity generated. So the figure of merit here is grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour of electricity. Okay, so let's have a look. These are the same countries, but now they're ranked according to the carbon footprint of their uh, power sector. And so obviously here a small bar, small number is good, and a large number is bad. So the six countries that have the greenest, cleanest power sector in Europe over that same period of time are Norway, Sweden, France, Switzerland, Finland, and Belgium. And if you compare that first group to that second group, you see that there is basically no correlation. The only country that shows up is Finland. I'm going to say a couple of words about Finland in a minute. What do all the countries in the green box at the bottom have in common? It's either hydro or nuclear, or both. For example, Norway, which is the, I guess, the most virtuous of them all, it's almost 100% hydro. Um, the next one up is Sweden, that's roughly 50% hydro, 50% nuclear. Then you have France, which is primarily nuclear. Switzerland, half hydro, half nuclear. Finland, which shows up in both cases, actually draws most of its carbon-free electricity from nuclear, hydro, and a little bit of biomass, not as much solar and wind. If you've been up there, there is not a lot of, no, there is not a lot of sunshine. And then you get Belgium. So this is not to say the solar and wind don't work, but the evidence, at least in Europe, which like I said, is a good example, points to the fact that countries that have decarbonized their power sector already very substantially uh, have done so with a combination of hydro and nuclear. This will become more evident later on when I show you an economic analysis of why you need something like hydro and nuclear in your mix to decarbonize efficiently. But for the time being, just remember that, that those are data. There, there is not much analysis to, to be done there. Um, and another fact to keep in mind is that in many important regions of the world, uh, nuclear is already the largest source of emission-free electricity, of carbon-free electricity, in places like the US and Europe. Um, that's true by a good margin. You can see here the the, 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 the data for different regions, indeed blue is nuclear, hydro is in orange, and then solar and wind and other renewables is gray. So in the US, for example, we, we get about a little bit over 50% of our carbon-free electricity now comes from the existing fleet of nuclear power plants. Um, in China, it's mostly hydro, a little bit of nuclear and solar and wind. In the EU, similar to the US, about 50%. And I also put the Republic of Korea there because I gave a few months ago a similar presentation in Korea. I wanted to show them their numbers. In their case, it's absolutely lopsided towards nuclear. So they get almost all their carbon-free electricity in, in Korea comes, comes from nuclear. So it's already an important part of the, um, of, of the, of the clean energy infrastructure. And while that's not relevant to Australia, in some countries there is a debate, what should we do with the existing nuclear power plants? And you know, if you shut down the existing nuclear power plants, your emissions will go up. We've seen that in the US, we've seen that in other countries. Okay, so these are important assets that should be preserved in our opinion. Now, um, do we need nuclear to deeply decarbonize the power sector? The emphasis here is on the word deeply. If you start with a power grid or an energy system that is dirty, uh, meaning that it emits a lot of CO2, for example, if it's wholly based or primarily based on coal, it's actually fairly straightforward to reduce the emissions a little bit. You could switch from coal to natural gas, that alone will give you lower emissions per unit electricity generated. You might also bring online some uh, uh, solar and wind and that will further reduce a little bit the, uh, the emissions. But if you want to do deep decarbonization, just to be clear, the world currently is at about 500 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. That's the average carbon footprint for the power sector. And according to climatologists, the power sector has to go down to less than 50. 500, 50. It's a factor of 10. Okay? That's what we call deep decarbonization. So the question here is, do we need nuclear for deep decarbonization of the power sector and 
my extrapolation of, of other sectors of the economy. All right, so we've done a fairly detailed economic analysis of this. Let me just give you the punchline, and then I'm going to sort of uh, try to explain the, the plots there. What we found is that if you exclude nuclear energy or something that behaves like nuclear energy, which really means low carbon, dispatchable, that means controllable, that you can generate your electricity when you need, not just when the sun shines or the wind blows. So that's called dispatchable. If you exclude something like nuclear energy from your deeply decarbonized scenarios, then the average cost of electricity in that system is going to go up. Okay, so this is the question that, or the issue that Robert um, alluded to in his, in his introduction is the system cost, the cost of the system. All right, so we developed at MIT and validated a tool that simulates uh, power markets. So you take a region of the world, this could be like the eastern seaboard here in Australia, uh, Queensland, uh, uh, Victoria, New South Wales, and for that particular power market, you need as input the hourly electricity demand, so 8,760 numbers. That's how much electricity is required to meet demand in, uh, in, uh, in this particular market. It requires hourly weather patterns, how much sunshine and wind you're gonna have at that particular time of the day throughout the year, again, 8,760 entries. It requires input for capital, operation and maintenance, and fuel cost of all the technologies they were planning to use, nuclear, solar, wind, carbon capture and sequestration, natural gas, storage, backup, everything that you're gonna put on the grid, you need to input the cost of them. And it takes all of these input together and out comes what we call an optical generate, excuse me, an optimal generation mix, where the word optimal means that something is being either minimized or maximized. And in this case, what's being minimized is the average cost of electricity in that system. So the chief figure of merit for this analysis is what you're now going to see on the y-axis here. Average generation cost, dollars per megawatt hour. Those are US dollars, but you can scale them in AUD. Now, we can run this tool for different scenarios. So for example, in blue is a scenario that artificially excludes nuclear. It says nuclear cannot play in this game. Then you have orange, it's a scenario with nuclear at a nominal cost, and then gray is a scenario at nuclear at low cost. And we can run these scenarios for different carbon constraints or decarbonization targets. So the last parameter, the last quantity that you need to pay attention to here is CO2 emissions. It's again the carbon footprint, grams per kilowatt hour of the overall system. Remember, we are at 500, we need to go to less than 50, okay? Now we can look at the plots. So I'm gonna show you two extreme scenarios here. On the left is Texas. Texas is very cheap natural gas and is wonderful renewable resources. Lots of sunshine and wind, very high capacity factors, particularly in the western part of the state. So this is a very um, uh, uh, unfavorable environment for nuclear because the alternatives are very, very, uh, very, very good. And so you can see that in, in a place like Texas, as you decarbonize your system, the difference in average cost between nuclear and non-nuclear scenarios is fairly small. Unless you're chasing the last few molecules, you know, one gram of CO2 per kilowatt hour. Unless you're chasing the last few molecules of CO2 in your system, uh, every nuclear or not every nuclear doesn't make much of a difference. So in a place like Texas, if you want to decarbonize, probably you can do it without, without nuclear. But most of the world, most of the regions that we've looked at, we look at this point as something like eight, different regions in different parts of the world actually look more like the plot on the right. The plot on the right is the most populous province in China. It's the region around Beijing and a couple of other big cities. So it's 50 million people or something like that. Now it's a higher latitude and they don't have, uh, and so they, the, the renewables are not that good up there and they have expensive natural gas. And you can see that in that case, even a fairly modest decarbonization targets say 100 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour, let alone 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. The difference between a scenario with and without nuclear starts to become significant. Factor of two difference, factor of three difference. So if you exclude nuclear, your average cost of electricity is gonna be much higher. Now the question, so that's what the analysis shows, and the question is, why is that? Well, it's actually fairly simple. If you're trying to decarbonize and meet demand and you exclude nuclear, then you're left with solar, wind, and storage. You need to have storage because by definition, renewables such as solar and wind are intermittent. So you get the energy when you get it. You don't get it when you actually need it. So sometimes they're gonna generate more than you need. Sometimes they're gonna generate less than you need. In order to sort of weather that, those fluctuations, you need to put storage, energy storage in the system. 
And in a scenario where you're only relying on renewables and storage, you're gonna have to overbuild the amount of renewable capacity, solar and wind, and the amount of storage dramatically, and that's what drives up the cost. So I'm here to tell you that nuclear is not the solution, nuclear alone, but it's really a combination. Even in the scenarios where nuclear is allowed to play on the right, there is a significant amount of renewable. So it's really a combination of something firm, as we call it, or dispatchable that can be controlled, and the variable renewables that gives you the most efficient way to decarbonize. So I spent a lot of time on this, but this is one of the central messages. You need all of the above. It's a combination that really does the job. It's, it's not one size fits all. Okay. So allow me to skip the next slide, which is essentially a different way to look at it. Now, unfortunately, the grid in many different parts of the world is going almost the opposite direction. It's becoming more complicated, overbuilt, inefficient, expensive. You've seen it also here in Australia based on the conversations I've had today. There is more stuff, more stuff being built on. Everything is overbuilt. Uh, supply, which means generators and demand and users can become more geographically separated and static. So there are these massive projects in China and the US to take uh, wind electricity generated thousands of kilometers away to the end users, to the cities, and you need to build all these transmission infrastructures. Now, the, the, the system becoming so complex and interconnected now is a lot more vulnerable to external perturbations, whether it's an act of terrorism or some extreme weathers, you can really have a destabilization of your, of your grid. Um, you also have capital intensive equipment that is a low, what we call a low utilization factor. Right? So because things are not used all the time, but they it, it cost money to put them online and then you don't use them all the time, of course, their efficiency is low and that all adds to the cost. To make things worse, you have all sorts of subsidies. In the US, we also have subsidies for nuclear uh, and, and, and for renewables for sure, and then unaccounted costs like the social cost of carbon. So it's become a bit of a, a, bit of an ugly place. Um, the poster child for what not to do to decarbonize have been, in my opinion, Germany and California. They spent, this is a real number, over half a trillion US dollars, half a trillion US dollars in intermittent renewables, and they've not seen significant reduction in their carbon footprint of the power sector. So it's been a disaster. Why? Because in both cases, they're bringing up renewables, but they're shutting down nuclear power plants. And, and nuclear, a nuclear power plant shut down single handedly wipes out all the benefits of having those renewables together. In fact, nuclear and renewables work wonderfully together. They're synergistic. It's not, again, alternative either or, it's a combination that does the job. Okay, so. All right, so build new nuclear power plants. I guess that's the message from the, previous, uh, from the previous analysis, but what about the cost of building these new nuclear power plants? Okay, so here, it's, um, it's a little bit a tale of, of two situations. What I'm showing here is the overnight construction cost. Think about that as just the cost of building the plant. Just the plant, it's not the fuel, it's not operation and maintenance. How, how much does it cost to build a nuclear plant? And it's expressed in dollars now per kilowatt, okay? so it's cost per install capacity. And these are uh, recently completed or under, uh, or under construction nuclear power plants in different regions of the world. And of course, the low number there is good, the high number there is, is bad. And uh, what you can see is that projects in Asia, whether it's South Korea or the United Arab Emirates or China, have been consistently lowering costs that projects in Western Europe and in the US. And if you look, if you pay attention to the scale, you see that there is a factor of two, sometimes higher difference. So why is that? How come the Asians are so good at building these new nuclear power plants and in Western Europe and the US we've been catastrophically bad at building them? So the first thing that might come to mind is that maybe we're building different systems, different reactors, maybe it has something to do with the technology. Not at all. In fact, all these are large, what we call pressurized water reactors, gigawatt scale. They all look very, very similar. In some instances, they are almost like the identical design. Okay? So China is building everything. They're building also the Western designs. And they've been able to build those Western designs faster and cheaper than the companies that develop the technology, which is ironic, bitterly ironic. Okay? So it's not the technology. So what is it? So we spent a great deal of time in our study um, reading the literature, interviewing construction managers from specific projects, some that went very well in Asia, some that went very poorly in the West. And we found out that the differences are not related to technology, they said they're related to other softer aspects of these construction projects. Number one, this is gonna make you laugh, thou shalt complete the design of the plant before you start building it, right? This is a 
engineering school, so it seems reasonable. And in Asia, they do not break new ground on these sites until the detailed design of the plant is at least 90% completed. Well, believe it or not, in the US and Western Europe, they started building these machines at less than 50% design. But there are reasons why they did that, and I can get into that. But it's suicidal. If you don't even know what you're building, you should not start building it. Because, because it puts you into a vicious circle, right? <laughs> so inevitably, you're gonna have to design something or redesign something as you build it. And when you do that, you have to go back to the regulator in the US is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission mm -hmm. and ask for approval for that change or for that new design. And that takes time. And if you have a construction site with a few thousand workers just sitting there waiting for the regulator to approve your change, that's a lot of money they go waste. But that's exactly what they did. And it's so you know, very, very sad. The, the, the other, the other uh, factor that was certainly uh, important is the maturity and uh, effectiveness of the supply chain. And, and triple S stands for nuclear steam supply systems. It's essentially the reactor components, the vessels, the pipes, the steam generators, and so on. So the nuclear industry in Asia has been building these plants continuously for the past 20 or 30 years. So they have a supply chain which is mature and, and efficient. And in the US and Western Europe, there was effectively a gap of about two decades, in some cases even longer than that, during which the industry did not build any new nuclear power plants. So a lot of the vendors, fabricators, construction companies, and so on, had lost the know-how for, for delivering these plants. And it really, really showed. We have, in, in the report, we have plenty of examples of, specific examples of, of components that cannot be fabricated to specs. Or, uh, or, 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 or construction, or for example, concrete that cannot be uh, poured uh, correctly and so on. Number three, in Asia, they tend to be more vertically integrated projects. So the company that designed uh, the plans, uh, that designs the plant is also the company that builds it. It's also the company that ultimately might even own it and operate it. And so um, in particular, the integration of um, construction and design and construction teams is important. You want to design something that is constructible from the very beginning. And again, it sounds grandmotherly, but that's an important statement. So it, with, uh, uh, any engineer with AutoCAD can come up with a design that, is, that looks beautiful on paper and on, on screen with tolerances that are 10 to the minus 15 meters. But then you give that blueprint to a fabricator and say, now really for me, says, well, I can't build it. You know, tolerances are too tight. There is interference and so on. So the integration of these two sort of disciplines is very important. They do it in Asia. They don't. They they've not done it in, in, in the U.S. and Western Europe. And then there are some other things that you can read over here. That we found is the main reason for the differences in costs. It's not the technology; it's just the way things have been have been set up in, in these projects. I'm going to skip the next two slides. I just want to tell you there are some aggravating factors that explain the gap, the the the, the width of the gap between Asia and Europe. Um, for example, labor rates, it's no mystery that workers in, for example, in China, South Korea, they, you know, they're not paid as much as the US or the UK and so on. There is nothing we can do about that. Thank God that you know, our workers are paid better. But then, of course, when you roll up those labor rates, uh, it does give you a little bit, of, uh, a little bit of, of cost penalty, which we quantified over here. So um, next, we wanted to see where exactly the cost of new nuclear is. And, um, well, it turns out everybody knows that the cost is the plant, okay? It's, it's not the fuel. The fuel is relatively cheap. Operation and maintenance can be um, executed very efficiently, cost efficiently, cost effectively. It's really the, 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 the building the plant is, is, the, is the cost. But, but we wanted to go at least one level down and really break down that, that cap, it's called the capital cost, the cost of the plant. And we look at numbers for three different designs. These, these uh, uh, sort of acronyms of these names will mean nothing to you. AP-1000 is an American design. APR-1400 is a Korean design. EPR is a French design. Okay? So we want it to be as, as broad as possible. And we got the numbers for the cost here. And uh, they all look more or less the same. And the first thing is the uh, direct cost of the equipment. Again, the vessel, the pipes, the pumps, the, the things that are brought from a factory to the site is only about 20-25% of the total cost, which is fairly frustrating for people like me that spend half of their career designing new reactors thinking, I'm gonna make them cheaper by design. Well, no, you can change the design, you can change the size and so on, but it's, it's not gonna make much of a difference. So where is most of the cost? You see that big blue slice there, right? That's what we call 
yard holding an installation. And in that category, what you have is the preparation of the site, all the excavation work that has to be done to lay the, you know, the, the basement, if you wish, or the foundations for the plant. And then all the civil works, so the containment building, all, all, the, all the concrete structures are containing that or, or are included in that in that category. The cooling towers, if you need if you need cooling towers or cooling canals, all of that, when you add it up, not just in terms of the materials cost, but in terms of the labor that that construction entails and the site supervision and the support structures around, that's about 50% of your cost. Then the other two categories that you see there in green and, and, uh, and purple are engineering costs. So how much time and and, and labor and, 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 uh, and money it takes to actually design and license the, the plant. And then finally, the, the purple there is uh, owner's cost, which is essentially the cost of the land insurance. Uh, excluded from this pie chart is the financing cost, essentially interest on capital that is given to you to build the plant, and that would add, uh, you know, it would add nicely to, to, to those owner's costs. But the point here is that if you want to reduce the cost of nuclear, of new nuclear, you need to attack all these cost drivers. You cannot just come up with a clever design of the reactor and expect it to be cheap. It has to, you have to attack those, those cost drivers. And this will, be, uh, will have some implications in the next slides. So what could actually make a difference? Well, the first, in, in terms of um, um, rendering the supply chain more mature quickly, as well as reducing the engineering costs, uh, standardization. This has been known for a very long time. There is very clear evidence from the French program, the Korean program, even the new units coming online in the Emirates, in Abu Dhabi, that when you build the exact same reactor multiple times at the same site, three times, four times, the latter units come in at a fraction of the cost of the first unit. Okay, so a task for a task, people learn. Right? It's the same workforce. They're doing the same thing. They're doing it better the second time than they did the first time. They're gonna do it better the third time, the second, the fourth, and the third. So standardization on multi-site units, that's definitely something that works. It's not an innovation, it's just something that I think the industry has got to do. Uh, number two, very important, advanced concrete solutions. So erecting reinforced concrete structures is a very labor-intensive business. You need to put in a rebar cage, which in the case of nuclear grade concrete is very, very high density. There's a lot of steel in reinforced concrete. Um, you need to uh, put formwork, wooden formwork, on the side. Then you pour the concrete, and then you have to strip the formwork. So it's a four step process, and it's very, very labor intensive. So there are ways to uh, either eliminate steps or reduce their. Uh, you know, their, their, their duration and cost, things like uh, steel plate composites or ultra high performance concrete. For those of you who are in construction or, or, or construction materials, these things will, will resonate for others is gibberish. But there are materials that really give you an opportunity to shrink the scope of uh, work associated with, with reinforced concrete. And a lot in a nuclear power plant is reinforced concrete, so you really want to tackle that, that issue. And then last but not least, I'm gonna mention modular construction. So traditionally, nuclear power plants are built in the following way. You bring to the side raw materials and individual components, and you literally build your plant at the side. That's called stick build uh, approach. And if you have an efficient construction sector like they do in China or South Korea, that approach has resulted and can result in in a cheap nuclear power plant. But if you have a non-productive construction, si construction sector or construction site like we have in the US and in Western Europe, that approach has been very inefficient. An alternative is to prefabricate relatively large modules in factories. Factories are high productivity environments as opposed to construction sites. And then bring those larger modules to the site and simply connect them. This approach has been used extensively in other industries which we um, which we uh, surveyed, and in some instances it has resulted in a reduction of capital cost up to 50%. Now, I can't guarantee that this is gonna work also for nuclear, but it's, it's something that absolutely the industry should, should, should try. So I think, we think modular construction and these other innovations that I mentioned are worth taking a look at. The closer analog that we found is for uh, nuclear submarines in the US, as you probably know, our submarines are powered by, by nuclear reactors, and they have taken in a uh, shipyard context, an approach where more and more the construction is done in modules as opposed to stick built, and they've seen very handsome uh, reductions in, in cost and schedule. I think that's something that should be pursued. Let me skip this one. 
So um, all of this has to do with nuclear in general. Uh, the existing technologies are large light water reactors, gigawatt scale. Now I'm gonna want, I want to spend a little bit of time telling you about why I think there is not just one, possibly even a need for looking beyond the existing technologies. Um, it starts from here. We compared nuclear in its traditional sort of embodiment to many different um, industries that you see here. Coal plants, offshore oil and gas, chemical plants, satellites, jet engines, pharmaceuticals, automobiles, consumer robotics, very diverse set of, of, of industries. And we categorized these different industries according to, to, to four categories. The first is excuse me, the size of the system at the core of that industry. So for a traditional uh, nuclear industry, it's basically a large nuclear power plant. It's physically very, very large. It's not unique. Coal plants are large, offshore oil and gas large. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, you have automobiles, consumer robotics, those are small. Um, second group, or second category, is that system factory fabricated? Again, remember, factories are high productivity environment as opposed to construction sites. Uh, nuclear plants traditionally have not. I've just spent 15 minutes talking about that. Uh, again, they're not unique, but there are many other products that are, uh, that are very efficiently factory fabricated, like satellites, jet engines, pharmaceuticals, and so on. Number three is the licensing of this technology associated with the demonstration of a very strict safety case. And again, nuclear is not alone. It is one, of course, lengthy. But uh, if you're in the business of jet engines, it's, they're subject to very, very similar and strict uh, you know, safety, safety requirements. And lastly, is the product that this system generates, makes, is it a high return, a high added value product, or it's a commodity? And what do nuclear power plants generate? Traditionally, they generate electrons that are put on an interconnected grid. And once those electrons are on an interconnected grid, they are the ultimate commodity. Nobody cares where those electrons come from. You plug your iPhone in the wall, you don't know what electrons you're getting. You may get it from power plant A, B, C, doesn't make any difference. So the ultimate commodity. So what you can see here is that nuclear is not unique in any one category, but it's the only industry that sort of has negative attributes across all four categories. I call these the perfect storm of fortunate attributes. It's really sort of like someone evil is designed to be the worst that it can possibly be. Um, it, this has really resulted, this has a very in, in, you know, sort of a compelling economic consequence. And that consequence is that if you want to bring a new nuclear technology to market in the traditional paradigm, if you want to bring a new nuclear reactor design to market, it typically takes on the order of 20 years and $10 billion. And now you can imagine you go to a Wall Street investor in the US, in New York City, and ask for a check for $10 billion and say, well, 20 years, you know, I'm going to bring you back a ton of money. You know, it's, it's absolutely not sustainable. So for nuclear to, to become um, viable economic, for new nuclear to become advanced reactors to become economically viable, I think the paradigm needs to shift. So it's going to be fairly simple. It needs to shift to three things. First, smaller serial manufacturer systems. The big beasts, uh, again, good in certain markets. China, South Korea, they know how to do it, keep doing it. But in the West, I think it's going to be really tough to, to, to stick with that model of a large, very large uh, uh, construction site built uh, plant. Number two, we need an accelerated testing and licensing. It cannot take 10 years to demonstrate the safety case. There has to be an acceleration there. Number three, uh, the industry should look at products that have a high added value, not just electrons on an interconnected grid. I added that. So just remember these three sort of uh, uh, requirements, which in my mind are, are quite important. Now I'm going to walk you through. How am I doing time wise? Right? Okay. We're doing okay? Okay, good. All right, so smaller systems. I think the industry gets this, at least the industry in the West, uh, you know, sort of uh, reads the pain on the wall. And um, it, they're now starting to offer and develop uh, smaller scale systems. The first category is generically known as small modular reactors. These are very attractive because they do not use any new fuel, any new materials, any new components. They are uh, smaller, shrunk down, scaled down versions of the larger machines. Uh, they tend to have very attractive safety features, which I'm gonna comment on in a second. But basically it's a technology that we know. Repackage, re-engineer in a clever way so that uh, you know it can be built faster and it can be 
uh, and it can be built at much lower cost than, than the large machines. So this is the type of like new scale, uh, if you've heard of this, or GE, BWRX 300, or other examples. They tend to be of the order of uh, from a few tens of megawatt up to say 300 megawatts. That, that's, that's the typical sign. Uh, number two is really different technologies called high temperature gas cool reactor and nuclear reactor. When you switch from one coolant to another, the first category is still water cool. If you switch to gas as your coolant, um, everything changes. That's just a nuclear engineering thing. So a consequence of using gas as a coolant is that now these reactors can operate at very high temperature. Um, that's good because there are some applications that require heat at high temperature. If you think about some chemical process or some manufacturing process, they not, not necessarily require electricity, they might require heat at say 600 degrees C. So with this reactor, you would be able to, to meet that need. In addition to that, for those of you who understand thermodynamics, if your heat source is at a higher temperature, your conversion of heat into electricity is also more efficient. So that also helps in the second law of thermodynamics. And then the last category that you see over here is truly revolutionary in my opinion. It's still a little bit in its early stages, but we'll see how it goes. I call them nuclear batteries. Other people call them micro reactors. So now this is a really different beast. What you're looking there is a tiny, tiny fission reactor, say less than 20 or less than 10 megawatt. And uh, it fits on a standard shipping container of the type that goes on boats, okay? And it's sort of a plug and play. The reason why I call it batteries because it's truly like a plug and play system. So you, 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 you ship it to some site where you have your application and you just connect it and off you go. It does not require uh, major site preparation. It does not require excavation, a lot of civil works. It comes in a package and that's it. That's your power plant. It's entirely factory fabricated. And it doesn't have to be refueled at the site. It would be basically shipped back to a centralized facility where it's refueled and then sent back if that's, that's what the customer needs. So an example here would be Westinghouse, Evinci. Like I said, it's a little bit early stages, but there are no, no showstoppers that I can see. So those are the technologies that are coming on, you know, on, uh, on, 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 on the horizon now. Uh, in all these cases, obviously, the economic case has to be, has to be proven, uh, also in the West and, and so on. For, for those who are built in, uh, you know, for the small modular reactors, high temperature gas cool reactors, you still need to reduce the scope of the civil structures, which otherwise, as I explained, accounts for 50% of the total. So the um, shortening of the cost and time associated with licensing, in my opinion, for these systems can come from the fact that they have a fantastically good safety profile. The, the existing nuclear fleet is already very, very safe. But under certain circumstances, you can have you know, accidents like Fukushima. Now, I have to say, after every accident, the industry has uh, made major upgrades of those plants, and the, the, the plants have become more and more robust. Okay? But for the next generation of technologies that you want to you deploy, you probably want to go even, even beyond that. And all these technologies have inherent safety attributes. So nuclear safety, 10 minutes, nuclear safety is all about uh, ensuring that you maintain cooling of your reactor under all circumstances. Okay. And in, uh, in traditional systems, you do that with engineer safety systems that inject water if you lose the ability to cool the reactor. In all these systems, you do not need to inject water. Essentially, the system takes care of itself. If there is an abnormal event, if there is an accident, the operator simply sits back and watches the system take care of itself. So this is what we call inherent or passive safety. Very, very good. Um, it, it can allow a couple of... Uh, um, of, uh, of big benefits, uh, it's what we call long coping times. If you have like a station blackout, like what happened at Fukushima, there would be no consequence on these plants. Okay, for example, that's one thing. Simplify design operations, fewer systems to operate, to maintain, etc. And last but not least, emergency planning zone limited to site boundary. Even under the worst case scenarios, you would not have off-site consequences, radiological consequences, so people would not need to be evacuated and so on. Uh, this is more than just theory, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, the design certification for new scale, which is one system with these characteristics, is now in its uh, uh, sort of uh, final, final stages in the US Nuclear Regulatory Commissions and, and things seem to be, uh, to be making a lot of sense. So that's the second piece. The third piece is higher added value. It can come from either a policy that says that not all electrons are created equal, some we like more because of their environmental value or their economic value and so on. That's a policy. Um, and or you could capture new markets. So instead of just putting electrons on an interconnected grid, you could start thinking about using nuclear energy to serve other energy needs. This could be heat for industry, it could be hydrogen that then can be used for uh, fuel cells. 
can be synthetic fuels, it can be water desalination, it can be remote communities, mining operations, propulsion even, so on. In all these cases, you're not competing against very, very cheap electrons for, say, natural gas, but you're competing against more expensive alternatives. And if you're into the business of decarbonizing those applications, then it makes a lot of sense to look at, to look at nuclear. So this is what I call beyond the grid. Uh, carbon emissions. This is the global breakdown of carbon emissions. Where are the carbon emissions coming from? All the conversations focuses on electricity, and you can see from this plot that it's only about a quarter of the total. So three quarters of carbon emissions in the atmosphere actually come from industry, transportation, agriculture, buildings. And again, if we're serious about decarbonizing the world economy, we need to attack all those sectors. That's why it's important to look beyond the grid, beyond electricity, and nuclear can play a role there. How big a role can it play? Well, if you are in a world where carbon is constrained, you see the bottom line there is natural gas. US is the cheapest natural gas in the world, okay? So if you're not carbon constrained in the US right now, the only energy source that makes sense is natural gas. It's as cheap as it gets. We got almost an infinite amount, so just keep burning natural gas. But if you are concerned about CO2, then natural gas is no longer an option, unless you do carbon capture sequestration. Then you are into nuclear and renewables. And what is um, compared here is the levelized cost of heat. LCOH is levelized cost of heat. So it's dollars per megawatt hour of heat now, not electricity, for the different options. You want it to be low carbon, so once again, natural gas is excluded. You want it to be dispatchable. If you are to provide heat to a factory, that factory wants the heat all the time. They don't want it only, you know, <coughs> intermittency at the mercy of mother nature. So when you take all this into account, the nuclear has actually the lowest cost of electricity, is dispatchable and low carbon. So there is a market for uh, nuclear in providing heat directly to industry. We quantify this for the US, we use the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency database for all US industrial sites emitting at least 25,000 tons of CO2 per year. We consider only sites that need at least 150 megawatt of heat. We assume that nuclear can deliver at a maximum of 650 degrees C. We looked at all sorts of different materials, commodities, non-commodities that can be uh, produced, that are produced in the US, and in which applications does nuclear make sense. And when you wrap it all up, we found that in the US, nuclear could basically displace about 7% of total annual greenhouse gas emissions, equivalent to 150,000 uh, megawatt of heat. That's a big number. That's a very big number. So, and that would be you know, essentially available now with, with, with existing technology. So in the transportation sector, I'm, I'm coming to an end here. Uh, in the transportation sector, um, you can either electrify the transportation sector to remove CO2, or use hydrogen in fuel cells. And the numbers shown here are for different countries, I put in also Australia. So if you were to electrify the uh, transportation sector in the US, it would require an order of 300 gigawatt of new electricity. That's new electricity that has to be provided to run basically electric cars and electric trucks. That's a huge number. If you do that with hydrogen, it's even bigger. Um, in Australia, it would be on the order of 18 gigawatt. And with hydrogen of the order of about 30 gigawatt combined heat and electricity. We're assuming that hydrogen will come from a high temperature electrolysis, which requires both electricity and heat to be generated. So big, big opportunities or big, uh, uh, big potential contribution of, of nuclear into these things. So I'll stop there. I have a couple of slides on uh, what's in for Australia. What does this mean for Australia? Where are the opportunities? I'm sure I can address that in the Q&A because people will say, okay, what does that mean for so let's stop, uh, let's stop here for the time being, and let's see if there are any questions. Okay. Absolutely fantastic uh, presentation. Um, we've got a special Australian present for him. This is a joint present between Nuclear Panel and the, the ANA. So this is our memory of Australia for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. That ends the evening.